Good morning, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me? Apologies for the... It's like working in a um, theatre in the round this morning. You have to remember to look both ways. Um, that if you are in the restricted view seats on the sides and you want to move to the stalls, um, you're welcome to do so. It's no cheaper to sit in restricted view. So, um, Welcome to the 12th um, Annual Learning and Teaching Conference. We're very pleased to see everybody. Very pleased um, that we ran out of lanyards, which means that we had over 400 uh, registrations uh, for this two-day event. And I'm very pleased that we're able to run two days again. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Matthew Williamson. I'm the director of Leeds, and um, Leeds are responsible. Leeds, if you don't know, stands for the Learning Enhancement and Academic Development Service, and we're responsible for organising the conference on behalf of the university. Um, I'm just going to do some housekeeping stuff, and then I'm going to hand over um, for the interesting bits. Um, in case you haven't already noticed, on the back of your badge is your programme. If you're with us for both days, um, you'll need to fish your programme out and then turn it round and you'll find, miraculously, your day two programme is on the other side. Um, it's a bit fiddly, um, but um, we're all intelligent people, so I'm sure you all cope. Um, the breakout rooms are all well signposted, but there are maps. There'll be maps here on the registration desk and there'll be a desk upstairs by the Butte Hall um, for the rest of the two days. So if you need a map, um, do access one. Um, as you'll have noticed, we've not given out conference packs this year. Um, in your um, welcome email, there's a link to download the conference app, um, which will enable you to run your conference electronically on your phone. Um, it's a free app. It's available in the Android and the Apple stores. Um, so if you want to download the app, that would be brilliant. You can link directly to Twitter from the app, so you can use uh, the hashtag. We do uh, encourage people to tweet through the conference. Um, it's great for people. Obviously, we can't all go to all the breakout sessions, so if you hear something really interesting and you're on Twitter, uh, it'd be great if you could tweet it using the hashtag uh, LTConf19, uh, and then people will see it, and we will collate some of those uh, and make them available after the conference. Um, after this session, all the uh, refreshments, coffee, lunch, and the, the wine reception will take place in the exhibition area, which is in Butte Hall, which is in the main building. If you don't know where Butte Hall is, there are plenty of sign posts, uh, at, signs, sorry, and staff will be able to direct you. Um, we've got external exhibitors and uh, internal parts of the university there with stalls, so please do go and frequent that. And lastly, um, as we always say on these occasions, we're not expecting a fire alarm this morning. If the alarm does sound, which is a continuous electronic sounder, and there's lights that flash as well, uh, please go out uh, the building as quickly as you can, but in an orderly fashion, and proceed to the assembly point, which is the south flagpole. So that's the, um, that side of the... I don't know where I am. Look, my spatial awareness is hopeless. Anyway, go out through, not into the quads, but the other way. So if you're looking out, you should see the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in front of you. That means you're at the South Flagpole. If you go somewhere else, you're not there. Um, that's all I have to say. I hope you have a really uh, enjoyable, useful, and interesting couple of days. And I'm going to hand over to Professor Frank Coton, who's going to officially open the conference. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And, and if the fire alarm does go off, can somebody please take Matthew in the right direction, please? Um, it's great to be here this morning. The, this is, as Matthew said, the 12th Annual Learning and Teaching Conference, and, and I'm long enough in the tooth to remember the first one. And at the first one, we had about 100 registrations, and ultimately, we had about 70 people attending. And what's happened over the years is that the attendance has grown substantially. And we're now, as Matthew said, at about 400 thereabouts. And not only that, the participation in the event has got stronger. So what I've noticed over the years in the various breakout sessions is the extent to which they are well attended. Whereas in the, in the very first conference, by the end of the day, there were a few tumbleweeds sort of rolling across the the various rooms. So it's great to see that level of participation in the event. 
I think it's a, a good indication of the health of our environment here, our learning and teaching environment here at Glasgow. Uh, we put a lot of store on making sure that we deliver an excellent learning experience for our students. And we are trying to make sure that we support our staff as well as we possibly can so that they can, um, they can actually teach in the ways that they want to teach and that they have the tools available to them. Now, in that respect, we've just gone through the, the enhancement-led institutional review, which is our periodic institutional review, which looks at the quality of the student learning experience at the university. And we've had the judgment on that. And, and just hold on to your seats while I tell you what the judgment is. Um, the judgment is that we are effective. That actually is the highest commendation that you can get in the process. So we are, we are pleased with that. Um, so the panel came to the university. They were here for uh, initially for one day. Then they came for a further five days. They had access to a lot of documentation. They had access to a whole range of different staff members and to, to our students. And at the end of the process, they are saying that they, they are going to commend us on a number of things. And I just want to highlight some of those because they, I think, make the difference between what we do and what some of our peers do. The first thing that they highlighted was the extent to which student engagement and partnership is embedded at this university. That is, is really, in my view, a testament to both the staff in the institution and the Students' Representative Council for the work that they do. We have a very constructive relationship with our student body. We have a relationship that allows us to disagree and not to fall out over it. And I think that's particularly healthy. It means that we can have an active and informed debate about the issues that are affecting both staff and students. So it was great to see the external panel identifying that. They also identified our strategic approach to widening access. As, as many of you will know, this university, um, although it is a Russell Group university and although it's a, a selecting university, it is actually a university that looks for talent wherever that talent is and gives it the opportunity to thrive. And we're very proud of what we do in this space. And we intend over the, the coming years to do even more. But it, it, it really is a testament to the work that our, our staff do going out into schools, going out into colleges, working with partners in the region and across Scotland to deliver a very strong widening access landscape here at the university. We were also commended on our approach to promoting equality and diversity in the university. Um, we recognized in a reflective analysis that we do not always get this right, that we have work to do, but we were very open about where we saw the challenges, where we need to go in the future. Um, and I hope as we continue to develop our community in the university, it will be a community that recognizes and celebrates diversity in the way that it should. We also will be commended on our academic skills writing program, which um, you will hear about if in the, the conference today, a bit, you'll hear a bit more about it today. We are one of um, few, possibly the only university that has a writing skills program like this that is applied um, across all of our intake. So it supports all of our students to understand their writing skills and gives them uh, a, a different, different levels or triage levels of support to develop beyond where they are so that they can um, be effective in the learning environment in the university. There was two other areas that were highlighted and, and one of them was around the fact that in our periodic subject review processes where we go into schools, into academic areas, to look at how um, that, that area is actually supporting learning, we have an anonymous staff survey now embedded within the periodic subject review process so that staff can express any concerns they have about the way we're supporting teaching um, and the way that we are developing the learning environment in that, that subject discipline. But the final one is one that I want to highlight because we flagged this 
in <coughs> our reflective analysis as an area that really is a work in progress for us, that we still have a lot to do in. But it is around the area of parity of esteem between teaching and research. The panel have commended the work that we have done on that, and they recognize that we have more to do. But I think the trajectory there is taking us to a good place. And hopefully, over the next few years, you'll see a number of developments in that space, particularly around the mentoring of staff on the learning, teaching, and scholarship track, and the support for teaching within the research and teaching track that will really make a, a difference to this university. So I think generally we have a very healthy learning and teaching environment and it is very much those colleagues from the University of Glasgow who are in the room today who make that environment what it is. And giving up your time to come to an event like this is part of that process. It's part of ensuring that we retain our currency and our approach to learning and teaching. And I would also like to take the opportunity to welcome those from outside of Glasgow University who are with us today. There are, um, there are uh, delegates at this conference from all over the world, from India, from Pakistan, um, et cetera, et cetera. I can't remember the full long list, but there is a long list of delegates from across the globe. And we are very pleased to see you here. We also um, are very pleased to see those from our sister institutions in the city of Glasgow and from across Scotland and the UK. We, ha we are as a university in a good place. We are expanding. You, you can see the James McCune Smith Learning Hub uh, coming through. You can see that we are uh, investing in developing the western site, uh, building out the western site. We're in a good place financially, we're healthy financially. So there is a lot to look forward to. And some of the things that you'll hear at the conference today uh, maybe just underline the opportunities ahead of us. But there's also a lot to look forward to today in this conference. And, and I want to come back to that because you're not here to hear me speak, you're here um, to hear all the participants in the conference. And it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our first keynote speaker. So the first keynote is from Professor Linda Price, who is the Director of Academic and or Organizational Development at the University of Bedfordshire. The title is Yesterday's Teaching for Tomorrow's Students. I have to say, when I saw the title, I did wonder, Linda, if it was a history lesson, but, but I realized, reading the synopsis, it's definitely not. It's very much about looking forward in terms of the way um, we deliver our teaching. And Linda's very well-placed to give that perspective. She's a visiting professor at Lund University in Sweden. She's also worked at Kingston University in London and in the Open University and has more than 20 years of experience in a range of national and international contexts. So please put your hands together and welcome Linda Price. Thank you. I'm just going to welcome all the people who are standing at the back. I'm not going to start until you come in and get a seat. So come on in, as they say, or come on down. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's always lovely to be in Scotland, and it's a real pleasure to be at the University of Glasgow. A real thank you to the organizing committee and those who suggested me. Uh, thank you to Scott and to Vicky and to Fiona for all the fabulous arrangements. It's been absolutely fantastic. So without further ado, I just want to start by in a sense, looking at where we are in the world and how the world is actually changing. And I often think I have to split myself in two to do my job. And today I'm going to have the opportunity to be a bit schizophrenic. So I like to point to things on the screen so you'll see me jumping about a little bit. OK, so how is the world changing? So let's think maybe 100 years ago how things might have been this lovely old car here looks absolutely beautiful. I'm not old enough to remember that, by the way. Thanks very much. Um, and how is the automotive industry changing? 
Well, we've got electric cars. In fact, I have one of these. I'm on my third one. And it's absolutely fantastic. And it is the future without a shadow of a doubt. And I think it's really important to think about all of those changes, the sustainability, it's not poisoning the environment. So big changes between where we were with, with in the car industry and where we are now and where we're going, quite different. I don't remember this either, by the way, telephone, but I, I do remember having seen some in some museums. Anyway, um, how we communicated a long time ago was very different. Not everyone had a telephone, not everyone had a means of communicating with others. And if you think of how things have changed now, I've only picked out three different icons, things are very different. Not only do ev does everyone, I'm sure everyone in this room has a phone, without a shadow of a doubt, wouldn't even have to ask you. I'm sure everyone's got a mobile phone. But not only do you have a mobile phone, you've got other ways of communicating. Uh, by instant chat, you've got audio, video conferencing, everything. And it's instant, it's in your pocket quite a lot of the time. And even some of the work I've done in South Africa, where there are students who are not very well off, they might not have fridges in their homes, but they've got phones. So it's quite interesting. So communication's definitely changed. Let's think about information and where we might have got information years ago. I spent a lot of time in the library when I was doing my master's many, many years ago. Um, and it was a lot of time looking things up and taking a long time just to get the information. Never mind, read the information. So everything took a very long time. It was quite protracted doing any kind of research. It was quite a problem. And I'll not say that all our students use Google. I would never say that. But certainly there are very fast means of getting information now. It's, it's out there, and then we can go to our libraries, we can download journal articles, all kinds of things, and you can do that from your desk. You don't even have to go into the library now. You don't have to go very far. In fact, you don't even have to do it from your desk. You can do it from your phone. You can do it anywhere. So things have changed quite significantly. Let's think about the medical field. Lots of nurses, you might have seen nurses like this a very long time ago, um, looking after patients, patient care. And of course, we have nurses now. But things are changing there too. We're starting to see lots more technology used in the medical field as well. We actually had a visit for one of these robots to come to the University of Bedfordshire. And actually it's quite interesting, once people got over that initial um, experience with this thing, um, actually the way in which people were interacting with it was like they were interacting with the, another person. It was quite interesting. Now while um, computers cannot do the things that doctors do, of course. They can do some very important things. They're very good at pattern recognition. And quite a lot of diagnosis is about pattern recognition. So they're quite good at doing things like that. And I think in the future, that's what's going to happen. It will free doctors up to do the important things that computers cannot do, which is around human interactions, around operations, and so on. So I think there's going to be significant changes there as well. So let's think about education and where we might have been maybe 100 years ago or less. And I'm sure my mother experienced things like this. What kind of education do you think is going on here? Anybody make a guess. Is it interactive? No. A little bit passive, would you say? Do the children look happy? <laughs> Dear help us all, they're probably getting rocked over the knuckles with a ruler if they didn't look straight ahead. Any collaboration going on there? No, no. If you look around the walls in that room, their information is around the walls. They've got maps, they've, they've got uh, all kinds of things around the wall. Um, but the students are sitting straight ahead. They're not collaborating. They're not talking with each other. And if you look at the back of the room, Uncharacteristically, the teacher's at the back, I assume, for the photograph. But normally, the teacher would be at the front. So the teacher was the source of the information. Okay? And the students were coming into that room to get the information. Probably because some of them didn't have libraries at home, they didn't have access to any information at home. Perhaps their parents weren't educated either. So they couldn't get that kind of support at home. So they came into that room to get the knowledge, to get the information, to, and to have it verified, probably, by the teacher. 
So let's have a look at how things might have changed. Ooh, have they changed a lot? Mm. Well, we've learned how to stack them higher and deeper, so that's, that's a step forward. Um, and they can bring their computers in with them, so that's probably good. But in terms of what's happening in this room, perhaps not a lot has changed. And it would seem, in this particular situation, that they're coming into that room to get the information again. But actually, as I've just demonstrated to you, there are other ways that they can get that information. So my question is, what is the added value here? Now, I'm not vilifying lectures. A stimulating lecture is a fantastic thing, without a shadow of a doubt. And of course, they have their place. But I'm just questioning, is that appropriate in all contexts? And I'm sure we're not doing it in all contexts, but I just want to think about when is it appropriate and when is it not? And when can the technology help us to do the things that, are, that can facilitate other kinds of activities later on so that we as the humans can do that really good interaction and development with the students to develop their discernment to know when the information actually is valuable, to help develop their skills so they know how to use it in different contexts. Because the world isn't very stable right now. Well, the less about that, the better, I guess. So, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. So we just need to think about the appropriateness of the teaching methods we're using for actually involving and helping students learn. So we just want to think about that. Now, this is some uh, statistics and some research that was done by the Australian Board of Statistics. And it's just looking at what the kinds of employment by skill type will be moving forward. So they've, they've reviewed this since 1986 um, to 2016. So if you have a look at the purple line, and this is where I would typically get up here with my little line and go, there's the purple line. There's the purple line, okay. So the routine manual activity is going down. So the demand for that is going down. So what we mean by routine manual, it's, it's a kind of a routine job, it's a manual job, and you would expect that. Okay, we would expect that. However, in terms of the turquoise line, okay, the routine cognitive, so that's more or less a routine job, but you've got to use your brain for it, you've got to be thinking. So it's, it's more like a white collar job, we could say, but it's routine. That's going down. So those jobs that we think might be fairly stable, you use your brain for, the need for those is going down. Okay. Now, the non-routine cognitive, that's that mustard yellow line. So it's not routine, but you've got to use your brain again. Those are going up. So that's suggesting that we're going to need people coming out of our universities and our, and our education system that are prepared to use their brains to do things that they haven't possibly done before or that we haven't necessarily trained them for. And even if you look at the red line, the non-routine manual, that's going up too. Not as fast as the non-routine cognitive, but nonetheless, it's going up. So even though it's a manual job, it's non-routine. Got to be thinking about making a different solution, doing things differently. So that suggests that we'll have to be preparing our students for a society. They've got to think about different solutions. They've got to come out of our education system prepared to do things differently, to think and construct different answers, probably in a way that they didn't have to before. Okay. So. I just want to think about that and ask you, what kind of a world are we preparing our students for? Is it stable? We've certainly only got to look at the UK in the last two years to figure out it's not. And who would have thought we would have been in the situation we are in with the turmoil in government? So it's definitely not stable. None of us could have imagined that that would happen. So I would argue that we're in this very geopolitical world, it's interconnected, it's uncertain, and it's fast changing, and it's most definitely digital. So that's what I feel we have to be preparing students for. And while all our traditions are fantastic, and I love them all, 
but sometimes we have to be careful that they don't sometimes prevent us from going forward. So that's a difficult balance to get right, to, to honour those traditions and move forward at the same time. So I just want to reflect on some work that I did with my very dear colleague, Adrian. Um, and it was looking at the impact of technology on teaching and learning, and was it having an impact? And we looked at oh, hundreds of, of research articles about transformations they were claiming in teaching and learning with technology. And we categorized them in terms of how they reported the findings themselves. And there were three main categories that came out. Efficiency, enhancement, and transformation. Now, most of them were, were claiming that they were transforming things. But in actual fact, in some cases, what they were doing were efficiency savings. They were taking existing processes, trying to make them more cost effective, more time effective, more sustainable. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we just have to be clear whether that's the transformation or not. Enhancement, the same. Um, it was ex sometimes improving the existing processes or replicating current learning activities. And there was only about 9% that were actually doing anything that was radically different and could demonstrate a real change in the, in the learning and teaching process. So we need to think, if we're going to use technology, how we're actually using it to transform the learning experience. And sometimes it's not necessarily about efficiency savings. Now, this is work that I did uh, in Sweden with Claire England and uh, Anders Olofsson. And it was a, a long study, a 10 year study, uh, which is not common because uh, it's quite hard to construct, it's quite hard to carry out a 10 year study in, in teaching and learning. And this was looking at the development um, of teachers who were all involved in an online pharmacy course and they were from three different departments. And what we did was we mapped their conceptual development in terms of their views of, of teaching and learning in higher education onto Trigwell and Prosser's conceptions of teaching and learning. Okay, so um, it's a long study and I don't want to go into the whole study, but um, just to say that uh, category A is where, student, uh, where teachers conceived of teaching as a somewhat transmissive activity, but like I'm doing now, standing up and talking to you, uh, right through to all the other conceptions. So it was gradually moving from quite a teacher-centered approach to a very uh, student-centered approach, which was category A. So if you look at the bottom here, I'll go to the other side in a minute. So we've categorized the, the teaching staff in terms of these were done by interviews, by the way, trying to understand how they went about their teaching and learning, what they thought about it. And over the 10-year pe period, Larry uh, went from A to A. Basically, his views of teaching and learning didn't really change much over the 10-year period. And he had quite a teacher-centered approach. I wasn't saying that that was uh, not important, but um, he didn't really change, okay? And Harriet had quite a, a reasonably student-centered approach to start with, and then she developed a lot further to uh, category E. So there's Larry there, A to A, and there's Harriet there from C to E. So E is more student-centered. So what we did was we mapped this against some data that we had in relation to student satisfaction. So if we go here, uh, as I say, Larry's own conceptions of teaching and learning didn't change over the period of time. He did have some improvement in uh, student satisfaction, but you can see in terms of all the other staff, it's lower. Okay, so this is, this is Larry here, okay. So students did give him some higher ratings over the 10-year period, but his is slightly lower. If we look at Harriet, which is the red line at the very top, starting at 5.5, her students are the most satisfied. 
Uh, her conceptions of teaching and learning did change. However, she's still got a very high rating right across the top. Okay. Now, um, complicated data, complicated picture. Nonetheless, you could say from this data that um, students are much more satisfied with teachers who display or who repute to having a more student-centered approach. Okay. And students who uh, are taught by teachers who have a more teaching-centered approach report being less satisfied. So that's just one data set, so just something to think about. Okay. Um, in terms of the departmental context, because I'm going to come to something a little bit later on, sometimes this can be reflective of the particular context that you're in. Now, let's think about Larry, whose teaching conceptions really didn't change over the 10-year period. Um, and look, we'll look at which, uh, which department he's in. So there are three departments, Department A, Department B, Department C. Okay, and all these departments are, are uh, co-hosting this uh, online pharmacy course. Okay, which so uh, and we use chat uh, cultural historical activity theory in order to uh, look at all of this. So if you look at the communities, I'll just look at the community line. In Department A, it was initially poor support for the community and much more gradual development. Department B, there was just no support by the community. Everybody was working more or less on their own, and they didn't really communicate much. And Department C was very supportive, community-based, lots of trust, lots of collaboration. Which department do you think Larry worked in? A, B, or C? Yes. Larry worked in Department B. Which department do you think Harriet worked in, that was the person who went from to a very student-centered area. Which department? C. Okay. So the way our departments think about things actually influences the way in which our staff can operate. Now, it might take a little bit more unpacking all of that, because you could argue this is just, you know, this particular data set. Happy to accept that. Complicated study, yes but something to think about, okay? In another related study, uh, Lynn Norton, uh, John Richardson and others find a similar thing, a similar finding. The departmental cultures can actually impact on how teachers conceive of their teaching and how they enact it. So something for those of you who are heads of departments to think about. Right, in terms of uh, conceptions of teaching and how we use technology, again, we've built on the work of Treguel and Prosser, and we've looked at how this, how the, how beliefs about teaching, how approaches to teaching actually impact on how our staff use technology. And it's, it's quite clear from the, the findings that um, those who might start with a very teacher-focused conception of teaching, and it's about the transmission of knowledge, how, how well can I get the knowledge across, how well can I make it available to students, that it tends to be um, a use of technology that uh, is replicating or suppl supplementing practices, and it's, it can be a little bit passive. Um, those who have a more learner-focused conception of teaching, and it's all, their approach is more about developing the learner, the kinds of technology uses do tend to be a bit more transformational, and that's about using the technology to help the students develop and help them do things, so that more active learning approach. So, I would argue there's a cascade here in terms of what we think about teaching affects how we approach teaching, affects how we approach using technology, it also is related to assessment practices, and this is built on work from Trigle and Prosser. It's out there, it's not all mine, believe me, um, and others. It affects students' approaches to learning, and then it has an impact on student learning outcomes. It's quite complicated, quite a complicated picture, actually. Right, I love this quote by Tony Bates, 
And he said, good teaching may overcome a poor choice in the use of technology, but technology will never save poor teaching. It usually makes it worse. And in my 20 years at the Open University, I saw that many, many times. And of course, you know, in the early days, 94, 95, we were experimenting with technology. And quite often, oh, we'll use the technology, it'll make everything better. And we were all somewhat naive around that. And we saw to our cost that many occasions it made things worse. And the students were really frustrated because we didn't really unpack what we were doing from a pedagogical point of view and what would actually work for those students in that situation. And I, would, I agree, it's not easy, but I think we still have to move forward. I just want to think about equality and diversity, and thank you for giving me that cue. It was very nice of you. Um, I think this is a really, really interesting situation. Everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. Sameness is not the same as equality. So I think we need to be very careful about that. And we can say, well, we give everybody an exam so it's all the same, isn't it? Or we tell everybody to, to write an essay on X. It's all the same, isn't it? So let's, let's have a little look at this. Um, I want to introduce something called the Universal Design for Learning Principles. I don't, you might have come across this, Alison, I'm sure. Um, but I think this is really quite powerful. Now, I've put the slide up, not because I want you to read everything, but I think I want to make the slides available later so you'll be able to read it. This isn't mine. It was developed by CAS, which is a big organization in the States, which has done a lot of research. And it initially was research around how one designs things, um, in an online context also, for people who might be compromised in some way. Um, and I, I love the expression, when I go to Dubai, they have signs up everywhere saying, people of determination. So for people of determination, how can we actually make things more equitable rather than just more sane? And there are three pillars around this, and it's multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Um, if we think about assessment, for example, okay, assessment's the holy grail, we all know that. But let's think about how we might inadvertently write in some barriers for some students without meaning to. So let's say we want our students to um, meet our learning objectives and we want them to demonstrate that they can critically understand concepts X, Y, and Z. We might say, write an essay to explain X, Y, and Z. When actually, we're not testing essay writing skills. We're actually wanting to examine whether they've understood or can display understanding and concepts X, Y, and Z. So why is it an essay if we're not necessarily T testing essay writing skills. And if we think of how things might be in the real world, how would a professional be communicating or demonstrating an understanding of X, Y, and Z? Let's take industry. If there's a problem in, in engineering and in a particular plant, or there's a problem with the machinery or something, a professional is not going to come in and these days, and write necessarily a, a five page or 10 page report. Well, typically, take a video of it, ship it off to, to whoever's back at the head office or whatever, with a few notes saying, here's the problem, da da da, I think this is it. Because speed is of the essence. Okay. So we just want us to think about how we assess and whether inadvertently we write in barriers without meaning to because it's the way we've always done it. It's the same with how we represent things in our teaching and learning. Perhaps the one medium where we're talking all the time or we're having a, a lecture isn't always the best way for everyone. So you might need to think about that. So um, I just want to think now about um, how we get this into practice. Um, because there's a lot of research that's out there, a lot of things that have been done in terms of um, research around 
teaching and learning, with technology, how we do it and so on, lots of theory and so on. But it's quite difficult to get that in, back into practice. And I would say mind the gap, because there seems to be a bit of a gap. And it's really about trying to concretize this complexity and take what might be a principled solution and actually put it back into practice. And that is really quite difficult. And I think it's, it's beholden on people like me who've worked in academic development for a long time to actually try and build those bridges. Because what happens is when we do research as researchers, we take things, we generalize them, we strip out the context quite often, we make a framework, and then when someone else comes in from the other side, the framework's great, and of course it's interesting and important, and it's a guiding principle, but actually making that work on a day-to-day -day basis can be quite difficult. And I had the experience to eat my own dog food, in a sense, when I was in Kingston. And I thought, okay, it's, it's time to eat my own dog food. It's time to actually put this into practice on a really big scale. Um, because I was involved in rolling out a new virtual learning environment right across the university. And I didn't want to just roll out a, a new virtual learning environment. I actually wanted to develop teaching practice. And really, for me, it was a lever to actually try and make that happen. Um, so we did start with a set of, of principled um, solutions. And then we moved that down into templates to help people. And then we had really strong staff development around this, starting with, here's your course. What would you like to do differently? And how can we help you? And then we transitioned that across. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that that actually did have quite an effect. And in some of the NS scores, in a number of, of attributes, uh, some of the scores went up 2%, which is not to be sniffed at in the NSS, the National Student Survey, for those of you who don't know. So that's quite difficult, taking it from research and putting it into practice. So I was asked to give an example of something. So I've chosen something which um, is more of a, uh, an art space, because it's, it's quite easy for those of us who've come from a science space to think about the ways in which we can transition across to using technology and learning and teaching. So I wanted to use something quite different and see how things actually could happen and how they have been happening in the university I'm working in. So this is an example of how it's been used. And it's quite a simple thing. It's not particularly sophisticated, but it works. Okay. So I've actually taken this from uh, the materials that are on our, our Brio site. So I haven't added anything to it. I haven't glossed it up. It's as it is. I've tried to fit it under the screen. So what the lecturer does is that in the, in the previous activity, because sometimes you're constrained by the physical environments you're in, you don't always have open uh, learning spaces, but if you're in a, a lecture hall or a hall like this or a teaching classroom, there's still things you can do. So at the, towards the end of the session, what, what uh, the lecturer does is she cues them for next week. And sometimes we call that flip classrooms. You can call it all kinds of things. But what it's doing is it's trying to use the time that you have with the students to help them talk and be active about their learning and trying to help them develop discernment skills, critical thinking, and so on. All the things, all that human interaction stuff that actually we're really, really good at as teachers. So what she does is she cues them up for the next week. So what they've got to do is they've got to, to look at one or another video, OK? And first of all, she gives them choice. So there's some student autonomy here. And student autonomy is really quite important in getting them engaged. And she sets up four areas they've got to look at, depth, uh, perspective, motion, and field of view. And then she asks them for the next week to do short analysis on these plays. And you can write, you can audio or video record your analysis. So she doesn't say, write four paragraphs. You choose, OK? Because part of the assessment method in a bigger assessment could be, why did you use a particular medium? And why was it useful or relevant for answering that question? Because our students will have to do that when they're professionals in the field. They'll have to figure out, at some point in time, a way of doing things, or perhaps a way of communicating something. <coughs> And they have to know that that's actually a valuable means of doing that. So we have to give them a space to practice that in. 
So we can see here that this person, is, this teacher, is not deciding for them what the medium of answering that is. So it's not a barrier to actually engaging in the critical components of this, which are the analysis of the depth, perspective, motion, and field of view. So going a little bit further, um, she then sets up an assignment, okay, and it has all the usual uh, information, but she's very clear. Everything's very clearly laid out and what they're going to have to do, where they're going to have to do it, and it's in the theatre and it's on our virtual learning environment as well. It's all very clear. Um, and then she tells them what she's going to do. So you're going to be working in groups, you're going to be making a three-minute dance video, and they get to choose what they're doing. So again, we've got student autonomy, and she doesn't say, you must use this technique, or you must use that technique. She's letting them decide, and that becomes part of the analysis. Okay. And this is where they then all get to come into the, to the theatre, and they view each other's piece of assessment. Quite an interesting thought. Okay. And then she sets out what the learning outcomes are, matched against the assessment criteria. And again, that's all very clear as well. And it's enabling them to see what the relationship is between these things um, and what kinds of things that she's looking for whenever she assesses. So it's not rocket science in a way. It's quite simple, but it's very, very effective. And the students rate this course really, really highly. And the things that they say is it's, it, about the course is, they, they get a, a chance to explore, they get a chance to engage, they get a chance to talk, everything's very clear, the assessment's rated very highly. And as you can see, it's not a big step. Okay. In terms of technology use in other areas, um, I don't know this Second Life looks a little bit dated and maybe that's to do with the interface. However, um, in areas where there are sensitive things to talk about, <coughs> this actually can be quite useful for some students. Um, and I'm thinking of uses in relation to um, exploring perhaps sensitive issues, if you're working in medical fields, um, working with patients who might have AIDS or very sensitive or confidential areas. And in one of the cases when we used it in Sweden, what we were doing was giving everyone a role. And of course, you can do this by role play. I know that you can do it in the classroom by role play. But the difference is, no one knows who the other avatars are, okay? So the standard at which the students engaged was very different because they didn't know who they were talking to in terms of whether it was, was their teacher, or whether it was another member of staff, or whether it was a fellow student. And what we found was the quality of the interactions and um, the authenticity with which they participated was higher because A, it was a safe space, and B, everyone was working quite at a quite a professional level because they, they didn't know who they were talking to. So quite interesting for some tricky areas. So just two things to actually think about in terms of what we might do or what we could do. Now, if you're new to some of this and you're a bit worried, where might I start? I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I would say dip your toe in the water. You can try something quite simple to start with. It doesn't have to be a piece of assessment. You don't have to rewrite your whole unit to start with. You can just experiment with something small to get your confidence up if you're not very confident about doing this. Um, and I remember many years ago at the Open University doing this where I would get people to sit down and think, well, actually, you know, what do you, what do you want your students to do when, you, when they leave? Well, well, what do you mean? We normally write the units first and then we decide what we're going to assess. Um, and I worked with a, a very clever chap at the, at the OU when I started many, many years ago. And he said, I always start at the end, Linda. And that way I know wh where I'm going to end up. So thinking about, well, what, what do we want the students to be able to do? And we can call them learning outcomes, we can call them anything, but what, what do you want them to be able to do when they leave? And how would this unit that you're working on and this course that you're working on, how would that help them? Then how would you figure out the best way of determining whether they'd achieved that? Whether they could do X, Y, or Z? How would you figure that out? And then what activities would be used to support that? And by doing this, what it does is it, it 
gets us away from thinking about the content we're going to deliver and then thinking afterwards, oh, how are we going to assess that? So it turns things the other way around. So if you're not very comfortable or you're, you're just new to this, I think that's an easy way to start. And you can start with something small and it doesn't have to be a big piece of assessment. Some of you, I'm sure, are much more sophisticated and you've done much of this. Um, I think starting with a course, if you're a course leader, that's really important because one of the things that I find with working at the OU and in other places is that um, once students have adopted to a particular approach, they like to see that replicated the whole way through. And quite often we get a bit of disjuncture between a unit here that's doing this or a module here that's doing that and the students want things to integrate and want them to work in the same way. So if you're in a position of leadership, rolling this out across the whole course, regardless of whether unit A sits here and unit B sits here, it's really important for the student learning experience. So have a, a holistic experience when they come out. That's also important for the NSS, as we know. Um, and I just want to uh, finalize things by saying this is complicated. Now, I've hit you with a very scary diagram. I'm not going to go through everything so you can think, oh gosh, you're going to be here forever. Coffee's never going to come. Coffee will come, I promise. Um, and this is, this is research that others have done as well, and, and some I have done. So it's not just what I have, have built or, or researched or anything. This was about pulling together the research that is in the field and how it all fits in terms of bits of the jigsaw puzzle and what does it tell us. Um, and basically it says there's a lot of complexity. That's the first thing. If you, if you don't take anything away from this, take away, it's complex. And I do understand that making this transition to using technology in, in our education in a very thoughtful and developmental way is tricky. Because we've got the, the external political environment, and we're actually all talking about that quite significantly right now in terms of Brexit and what it means to perhaps funding and students and all kinds of things. Certainly in England we've had the NSS and the TEF. That's been a huge driver in the political environment and it's, a, it's impacted very significantly on what universities do. And unfortunately not always to the, to the benefit because there's much more competition and less collaboration. So that has immediately an impact on the institutional context, what an institution does and it can be at odds with its philosophy. Then you've got your own internal <coughs> political environment, what you think you're about, what the tensions and, and pressures are there. And of course there's research and teaching, they've always got political dimensions to them and there's a, a tension sometimes between that as well. Um, our institutional policies affect what we do as well, quite significantly, not least of all in terms of learning spaces. What kinds of learning spaces should we be designing for our students as we move forward? Should we have less lecture theatres? Should we have no lecture theatres? That determines then what people actually do in, in the departments, how the departments re respond to that, and in terms of what their institutional conditions are, what they actually think their philosophy is as a, as a department. And we've seen in terms of, of Larry, working in a particular department where there wasn't a lot of community and there wasn't a lot of talk. He had a very um, teacher-centred approach to teaching and he tended to work by himself. Is that what we want? Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's, maybe it's not. Okay. So the, the departmental context is very much affected by the institutional context. Also, the teacher's context is affected by that as well. Not least of all complicated by their own academic identity, what you as teachers think you're about, what your philosophy is, what your beliefs about teaching are, how that inf influences what you do, um, and then how you're influenced by what goes on around you, what your context is in a department, what your context is in an institution, what the promotions criteria are. Not that everybody's wanting promoted all the time, but it's a currency. It determines what's valued in the institution. And then things circulate around that. And then you've got the students <laughs> who come with their own sets of, of um, 
values and views of the world as well and their approaches to teaching and learning and some of that might well be impacted by the environment that they experienced at schools and college and all the rest of it. And then they're influenced by what the teacher does because if the teacher is going to give them exams at the end of the year, then they're going to work towards that. That's what they're going to work towards because they want to pass. And we were all like that, who didn't go to the library and photocopy all the exam papers and then study to the exam papers. I certainly did, I put my hand up. And I actually didn't understand the course until I started to, to revise for the exams. I have to put my hand up. I went to the lectures and thought, OK, job done, fine. Oh, right, the exam's next week. I better do something. So very complicated picture. So I wouldn't want to in any way undermine the task ahead. And I understand the complexities in this environment. But the world is changing. And the technology is out there. It's going to change, I think, just about every industry and area that we're in, okay? And we need to prepare our students for that. So we need to think what it is we need to do to help them and how we need to change them and prepare them for a life of change and moving forward. We've got to seize this and we've got to be owners of our own destiny here. I think certainly in England, we have not been owners of our own destiny in higher education and the, the media is vilifying us, the politicians are vilifying us, and we're saying we're not giving value for money, we're not giving this and we're not doing that, because we haven't seized the opportunity to define the space. Now, there will be other people wanting to move into this space of digital teaching and learning, and we've seen that. And they will perhaps take charge of that space, and what we might end up with might not be for the good of higher education, might not be for the good of society, um, and it might be to the detriment of what we stand for. So this is difficult, but the change is coming. And I would argue we have to be in charge of it. We have to own it. Oops. So tomorrow's teaching. What's that about? What we think about higher education influences what we do and how we do it. And that's the fundamental thing that I want to start with. It also influences how we use technology. So we have to think what kind of a world are we preparing students for? And how do we actually get them ready? So while we need to attend to all of those factors that I've shown you in this, what I call the educational ecosystem, the biggest change we need to make is in our thinking, how we conceive of our teaching and what it is we want our students to be able to do when they leave. So thank you very much. Haven't interrupted your coffee, I hope. You'll be going, hooray, we'll be off for coffee in time. So thank you very much. Actually, you, you haven't interrupted the coffee at all. You've finished, you finished well on time. So we have time <laughs> for some questions. That's fine. Um, now, we've got roving mics on both sides of the room. So. Who would like to, to ask the first question? Yes. Uh, if, sorry. If I just hold for the mic, sorry. I should have said that. If you hold for the mic, this is being recorded, so it's just to, okay. to capture it. Thank you. I liked your slide about the effect of teaching concepts on student appreciation, but I was wondering, because I think one of the teachers that was appreciated, she was appreciated already a lot before changing. So is it actually having these concepts or being open to concepts that makes you a good teacher? That's quite an interesting observation and, and that was something that we did think about as well. Um, it, was, it would also be fair to say that that member of staff was fairly new to teaching and Larry was not fairly new to teaching. So I don't want to make any other um, conclusions on that because I said it was a particular data set and I challenge all of you to come back with different data sets and to say well our findings were different because we're that's where that's what we do in higher education critical debate and you come back with something different and say actually our findings are different so please do but that it's difficult to construct a 10-year study and to follow it through because we start you know we started with many many more participants at the beginning but it's 
it was multifaceted and that we just tried to not look at one thing. So as I say, I tried to eat the own, my own dog food with the, the, the um, conceptual ecosystem. Um, but yes, you, you could be right. Um, in some of the work I've done in Lund University, uh, we did look at that as well. And what we did see was we would take graduate assistants and we would uh, support them in, in developing teaching and learning skills. And we found that there was rapid change in development in how they conceive teaching and learning. Um, and they actually have that implemented uh, as part of their graduate uh, teaching scheme. And certainly um, in LSE, they started to do that as well. They're, they're uh, PhD students, they actually um, put them through this graduate teacher training to try and make sure that they've, they're doing this at a time when they're thinking about their roles and they're new to teaching and learning. And I have a paper on that as well. I didn't mention it, but there's, I can talk to you later about that. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. <laughs> Linda, thank you very much for a fascinating keynote. Um, on the one hand, you offered us many frameworks that we can use to help us design our, our learning. Um, but on the other hand, you emphasized the complexity of the whole system um, that we have to take into consideration learner, teacher, departmental and institutional context. What advice would you give us to try to take on board that complexity but still come up with simple designs at work? Um, okay, uh, if I can relate that back to what I did at Kingston, uh, what I did was set up a, a steering group and then I had a user group and then I had user groups within the faculties and then I had student user groups. So you, it wasn't just a downward um, information cycle, it was actually very much developmental and upward and downward. Um, because for all of this to work, you really need to be touching all of those, those four points. Uh, and it was, it was a challenge because along the way we had to change policy. Um, we had to change some things around, uh, I'll call it sets, but the, how we store student records. We had to change some things in academic registry. Um, we had to change some departmental um, setups as well. Um, and then we had the students giving us reviews. Well, this doesn't work for me. And it was good for the students to feed that back because sometimes as teachers, and my hands up here too, I think I know best. And I'm not saying that arrogantly, but you know, if you have a lot of experience and you've done things for a long time, and you can say, well, no, I think this should work. But sometimes you have to stop and say, well, you know, just let's listen to the students. So that's what was effective in that situation. But you have to have you have to have multiple stakeholders at multiple levels, and you have to have people at different levels. Not just making policy, but user groups actually taking something like a design and trying and testing it in a in a small pilot or a small environment, and before you start to roll things out. So that's how we did it, and then we rolled it out into templates and things like that. Um, and in the end, uh, there, was, there was good buy-in, but I had to work really hard on comms. I had to have a big team, to be fair, 26 staff working on this. Yes, um, and it does, it does need investment. But I had seconded staff in from, senior staff in from um, faculties into the user groups, but they weren't staff who had just... Um, I have to say line management authority, they were senior experienced teaching staff. And sometimes uh, we don't value that as much as we could or should do in the development of some of these activities. Does that help answer? Okay, now, now I'm aware that somebody tweeted earlier that there's nothing wrong with the cheap seats and I'm guessing these may be the ones over there. So I'm just gonna move um, oh. out so that I can see everyone. Are there any other, any? Any further questions? Yes, Joanne. Firstly, thanks very much, Linda. That was a really interesting um, talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, going back to Larry and Harriet, is that right? So I'm speculating here, but Larry probably spent his time 
or his understanding of teaching was that his role was to tell the students lots of things and Harriet likely thought that her role was to help the students find information and apply it. So my question is, how can we encourage staff to maybe spend less time developing content and information for students and more time facilitating and supporting learning, particularly as you see when students have you know, an abundance of information in their hand? Um, one of the things I like to do is actually work with uh, the course as a team and sit down and talk about what's the course philosophy. What are we doing and why? Uh, and we used to do this at the OU and, and many a time we used to talk about the meetings where there was blood on the carpet. There was such strong debate around that. But we have to create those critical spaces for that debate and talk about well, what are we doing and why. Um, and I think it's important to have someone who is maybe from Leeds or someone like that that is working with them to say, okay, so how can we change some of these things and how can we easily do that to support that development? Because for some people it's really quite difficult because those models of teaching and learning are very personal um, and they're very deep-seated. And of, of course they are because they're about your academic identity. So it has to be done with respect and with care and with caution um, as well. And then it has to be done within a certain context because within certain contexts, certain things actually might be appropriate. But I think that's why that the development of the course as a, as a team entity with some support from uh, those who are working in Leeds or other, and, and volunteering you yeah, because I think you look like you're ready to be volunteered <laughs> would be a supportive way to do that. And it might be you start with one small thing at a time. And I've, I've done that in, in University of Bedford, you have done that in relation to computer science was a particular area, a particular course which was struggling and some negative feedback from the students and that was how we did that. And we did five sessions with them to start with and then looked at, okay, how can we actually construct this? So it was not, you know, come to a workshop and they'll tell you, it was actually, right, let's get, let's get your assessment out. Let's look at what you're going to do. Let's look at how we could change that little bit. So we did it incrementally. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, now we've got time for maybe one more question. Are there any more questions? Yes, one over here. I should say that, that for those that, that do have questions that we haven't been able to answer, um, Linda has no easy means of escape, and when coffee comes up, that's your opportunity, I think. So Absolutely. Please take it. Thank you very much for your talk. You mentioned four different stakeholder groups. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> you mentioned four different stakeholder groups, and there's quite a large power imbalance between each of the different levels of that. How did you address that to make sure it didn't become a top-down process? Um, because some of the things that we did was give some of the user groups uh, the, the space to take things we were suggesting and try and test them. So we would suggest, or they would suggest to us, this should happen. Okay, and we say, okay, right, n you know, work on that, knock it out for us, and then come and demonstrate it to the, to the strategic leadership group. And then that's how we would get that dialogue going. Um, so it was a, a case of trial and testing things at those levels and then bringing them back and then bringing them up and down and up and down. Um, and I would attend a number of those meetings. Like whenever we were rolling this out, I actually ran stakeholder groups with students, with staff, and I went to every single one myself so I could hear those voices. Um, and then I could make representation up. But it was, it was enabling them to trial something and bring it back to the table. Um, and that was how we, we managed to do it, actually working on particular activities and things. So it wasn't, a, so it wasn't just this talking shop. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, well, that, that brings us up to the, the coffee break. The, the, there's also the opportunity during the break um, to view the exhibits in the Butte Hall. Um, so if you have time, then, then please do take a, a look around there. But um, for now, let's thank Linda once again for a very stimulating presentation. So thank you. Thank you.